Welcome to ATSA Back Channel, Conversations with Sexual Abuse Prevention Experts, presented by ATSA's Education and Training Committee. I am Alejandro Leguizamo, and it is my pleasure to have a conversation today with David Prescott. Uh, David Prescott is a mental health practitioner with over three, 36 years of experience in the field. He is the editor of the Safer, Safer Society Press, he is the author and editor of over 20 books in the areas of understanding and improving services to at-risk clients. He is best known for his work in the areas of understanding, assessing, and treating sexual violence and trauma. He is the recipient of the 2014 Distinguished Contribution Award from the Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers, and the 2018 recipient of the National Adolescent Perpetration Network's C. Henry Kempe Lifetime Achievement Award. Mr. Prescott regularly lectures and provides trainings around the world. It is my pleasure to introduce you to David Prescott. So welcome, David. Hey, it's nice. great to be here. Nice to have you. Uh, so we're here uh, to talk about the Good Lives model, and uh, I'm wondering if you could tell us uh, a little bit about the Good Lives model. Sure. You know, maybe the best place to start is to acknowledge that, um, that I'm part of a community of people that have been involved with the Good Lives model for a long time, <laughs> and that I wouldn't be talking with you today if it weren't for a lot of my collaborators of the, the present and the past. Um, originally, it was started by Tony Ward, um, who I continue to work with uh, to the present moment. I think I owe him an email, um, even as we're doing this. Um, uh, historically, there was also uh, Pamela Yates and uh, Mayumi Purvis. And of course, um, one of my chief collaborators is, is Gwen Willis, who's uh, done a lot of work with me um, in this area, and we've implemented it in a lot of different places. So originally, the idea was we had these ways of doing treatment that made a lot of sense at the time, which was this person has caused serious sexual harm. What can we do to make sure he doesn't do it again? It seemed so simple at the time until we realized that all of our treatment goals were about what is this person not going to do in the future? And um, I don't know if you've ever tried to stop a bad habit. Uh, most of us have. And trying to set your goal on what you don't want to do or you don't want to think about is really, really hard. So um, I, I think one of the first aspects of the Good Lives model is that it's organized around what can people do? What can people accomplish? What kinds of states of being are, um, are appetitive, are desirable uh, to, this, um, uh, to this person. So originally, Tony organized this around um, 10 of what he called primary human goods. Um, that's three words, three relatively big words or big concepts. Uh, so that was uh, sort of difficult for some folks to get their minds around. So these kind of 10 overarching areas drawn from, uh, drawn from everything from philosophical writings to research, et cetera. But all of it, all of it, all of it was built on the assumption that all human beings have some core goals in life, things that we want to accomplish or attain or things that we want to be. We all have them, even though they take different forms uh, for all of us. And so many people have resorted to um, sexual offending, for example, uh, as an attempt to meet these various kinds of goals. If you think about it, uh, things like having a sense of inner peace or peace of mind, a lot of violence has taken place in world history as a result of people wanting to attain some kind of peace of mind or to establish independence and autonomy, et cetera. So fundamental is this idea that um, all people seek out these kinds of goals. And so the good lives model, if I had to boil it down to there's one thing that makes it different from the other models that are out there is an explicit twin focus, two goals. The first is, of course, to manage and um, uh, cope with risk factors, but the other is to lead a more fulfilling and satisfying life. So it's attention to both of these, uh, of these things. 
there's these 10 overarching goals, which I don't need to get into, but I'll just say, every one of us wants to be good at something in our lives. Everybody wants to feel as though they're a part of a group. Um, everybody wants to be connected to others and everybody wants some degree of independence and autonomy. If it's okay to mention it, Alejandro, I know you and I have had some discussions about this um, as well. For example, um, I've often talked about balancing independence and autonomy with connection relationships and these mm -hmm. kinds of things. And, and you said, you know, David, this, um, uh, this can be um, quite a, a sort of Anglo-Saxon concept and that a lot of other cultures are very collectivistic. And I think the way I typically respond to these things is the way that we balance these needs tends, uh, might, might vary across culture, but, but we all have them. So I, I'd say those are, the, um, those are the core principles to all of this. But if I could, I'll just add a couple of other pieces, which is really fundamental to the good lives model in doing this kind of work is understanding which of these overarching goals were implicated in somebody's offending. Um, one of the, the number one good lives model mistake that I've seen is people saying, let's just have our clients um, uh, work towards these goals that everybody wants. How, much, how great will that be? It's yeah. ever so positive, et cetera. No, nope. there's a time and a place to get, uh, to get into the weeds and to really yeah. get in deep in terms of all of these things. The other challenge that I've seen people face is believing that they already know the good lives model or that this is so congruent with their values that um, it's what they've been doing all along. People say the same thing sometimes about motivational interviewing. Um, and I always find when I hear that, that people haven't studied the model enough. It's nuanced, mm -hmm. it's difficult. Um, as is uh, motivational interviewing. And then the last thing that I see as a kind of obstacle or a challenge to, to implementation is when people try to oversimplify it, where they say, mm -hmm. well, 10 goals is a lot. We've shortened it down to five or six. Usually something goes missing in that mix mm -hmm. and it's not always uh, such a great idea. So anything that I left out? No, I... Oh, part of the reason why I, uh, you know, complete honesty, uh, I'm partial to this, uh, to this approach is the the logistic, the holistic way of of thinking about uh, about the person, and uh, and I've had the experience of asking of asking clients, you know, what are what what's important to you, and and the reaction. Uh, you know, when looking at the different dimensions or the different goods, what is what is important to them, what is not as important, and uh, and kind of like visualizing it as a musical equalizer, where you know you move things depending on what's important to the client. You're not going to go well. Spirituality is important, so you're going to have to go to church. It's like oh, I'm, I'm atheist. No, oh, you're going to church. It's good for you. Uh, so uh, I like this this modulation. Uh, that uh, fits the individual in a holistic yeah. way. Yeah, I love the uh, the equalizer metaphor. That's a good one. And I was aware of one lawsuit uh, where somebody sued somebody else over the fact that they felt that spirituality was being sort of shoved down their throat and um, that they only worshiped the, the Norse god Thor or something. It was something along these lines. And so um, I guess what I what I always think about is, any of us at any time um, want some kinds of things out of their life. And just, you know, as one very brief example, I'm really enjoying this cup of tea right now. Um, I wouldn't mind it if it was just a little bit warmer. Okay, mm. why? Well, if, if this tea were a little bit warmer, it might give me a little bit more of a sense of happiness and pleasure. And if I had more of a sense of happiness and pleasure, uh, I might also feel a little bit more accomplished that I'm really getting this how to brew a cup of tea thing down. I mm. might be feel a little bit of that sort of excellence um, uh, and feel like I have some sense of agency um, with all of this, et cetera. And if I, if I really felt that I had um, some happiness and pleasure and a sense of agency, then that might give me a stronger sense of hope for the future. 
So I know it's just a cup of tea, but upstream from everything that we do or everything that we want is usually some broader goal. Our trick is to figure out where that is um, in our clients' lives. And to, to get back to what you just said, it was a wonderful quote. I believe it was in 2006 by Tony Ward, Teresa Gannon, and Ruth Mann, three very brilliant people. And they said, you know, our clients want the promise of better lives and not just the promise of less harmful ones. Yeah. So that's the good lives model. I, um, I'm reminded of uh, uh, one of my one of my advisors in grad school. Uh, he was in in positive psychology, and uh, a, a quote from him. You know, when when you're talking about being good at like uh, at brewing tea and enjoying tea, is uh, uh, he was asked about happiness. What is happiness? And he said, happiness is the product of our pursuits, not the pursuit of happiness per se but the pursuit of things that make life worth living. So it's that agency, what is what, what things make or what the Japanese call the ikikai, what are the activities that make it and that make life worth living? Yeah. And and you know for the people the the men the 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 adolescents that we treat, you know, what is it that brings them joy uh, in those moments? It could be brewing tea it could be trying to master a difficult guitar song uh it could be gardening it could be as long as it doesn't involve beating up the neighbor uh it's good yeah yeah um and um uh yes i'll, I'll come back to some other points uh, I've, okay. i'm thinking about a lot of different things at this point Okay. Um, going back a little bit to the to the more structured things, because uh, in the field we have gone through relapse prevention, and uh, you know we have reduced everything to very 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 small steps. Um, and uh, there is the prevailing model at this point uh, that we all have heard of is the the risk need responsivity model, the R and R, and there's research. Uh, to back it up, and uh, it, it does seem uh, that it can lend itself to a very structured, manualized approach, and uh, that kind of like takes away the magic of therapy for me, but um, I know that uh, the Good Life's model can, and uh, R&R &R can, uh, can combine and can uh, collaborate or, or live together, um, could you tell us a little bit of how the GLAS model fits? Sure. <laughs> so first of all, the Good Lives model is an overarching model, and it's, it's based on um, uh, many bodies of um, uh, philosophy and, and research. And, uh, and uh, so I, I think of it as an overarching model. Uh, the risk and needs and responsivity principles, um, risk, need, and responsivity principles are principles, and they've got excellent research behind them. Uh, so um, looking at r, &R as it's called, I, I often find myself a little bit perplexed in that these are principles, and it's uh, uh, a properly, uh, properly implemented. The good lives model can adhere to these three principles. A number of things have gone wrong over time. Um, one thing that went wrong is there was an argument in the scholarly literature about whether or not the Good Lives model added or contributed anything to the principles of risk and need and responsivity, and then others. So you know when it, it gets to the point where people are saying, well, you lack explanatory depth and, and this sort of thing, then you've got a purely academic article uh, or argument, and it's not necessarily helpful. I've always viewed it as both are really, really important, and both have a lot of research to, um, to recommend their use. However, um, it has occurred to me that there's been um, some work with r, r that's ended up being highly structured, very sort of uh, hyper-manualized, if you will, and I've often wondered how people do the responsivity part. If we, uh, the dictionary definition of responsivity is the quality or state of being responsive. 
And so there's, um, you know, there's specific and general responsivity and people have uh, defined these in, in various ways. My point is always, um, is the work you're doing something that your client can respond to? And if it's really hyper-manualized, Sometimes that can be helpful. Um, sometimes our clients are saying, just give me some skills. I need to start with some skills because I really could use some help. And that can be helpful. Is that the whole, the whole uh, shoot and match? I don't think so. I think there are other uh, things that can help. Um, and then, so we've got the, the hyper-manualization issue. Good Lives model is a way to do, can be a way to do um, r and and that's another consideration. And I, I, I guess I just think that all of these things can live uh, uh, together peacefully. Um, I would say that in terms of the risk principle, yeah, higher risk people tend to use, uh, need more treatment. And yeah. if that's with the Good Lives model, then that's great. High risk people tend to have a higher level of needs and that's where the uh, good life goals um, all come in and higher risk people tend to have some specific responsivity issues that the good lives model mm -hmm. seems to be a natural fit for. Um, the mm -hmm. other and last and final place where I've seen r and and good lives model not get along, it's only one example, but it was um, uh, the case of a couple of really, really, really prominent really bright guys. And they said, okay, good lives model seems to be the flavor of the day. Let's take it out and, uh, you know, for a spin and see how we like it. Now, these were folks that had been steeped in r, &R since since the very beginning, and they ran an absolutely excellent program that they studied. These guys are the meaning of, or if you were to look up scientist practitioner in the dictionary, their faces would come up. Uh, so they tried the good lives model and they said, we don't like it. We, uh, we found it to be too confusing. Now, mm -hmm. part of me said, but if you've already had something that worked and was doing so well with risk and need and responsivity, maybe you should just stick with that. But mm -hmm. they did the right thing. They tried to figure out what would be helpful, uh, et cetera. I guess where I come down is um, use it as a way to uh, meet the, uh, these principles, or maybe you want to try something something different, but I, I really think if you're going to do good lives model and you don't also have both of your feet planted in risk and need and responsivity as principles, then you might be subject to making a mistake. Within that, there can be a place for a hyper manualized um, uh, manual, uh, sort of approach towards treatment to get people started to give them the skills that very often they're asking for at the outset of treatment. I hope that makes sense. Yep. Uh, and uh, as you're as you were talking, I was thinking about in a sense, it's almost like the responsivity towards the therapist as well, because we're going to have different styles and we're going to respond differently to what's more comfortable with us or more aligned with our with our personality. Um, so that, uh, you know, uh, even for newer clinicians, the more manuals, the less anxiety producing mm. things are, uh, but others uh, are more comfortable with, uh, with, with that. And, and then there's, uh, uh, there's a bunch of us who are kind of like, okay, you know, um, in some ways, I don't want to say more relaxed, but more loose in a sense. And that, that doesn't sound right either. Uh, but we're kind of like, uh, okay, we'll, we'll go with things and, you know, we'll assess this, this and that, but uh, in, a, in, in a less regimented way, in a sense. Yeah. Um, but it's like, it's like the, the various religions, we're all looking at the same goal and we look at our path and we're like, no, the ours is right. And, uh, you know, we're all going towards the same place. Yeah. You know, the two clinicians that I was just talking about, um, who I, I hold in extremely high regard, um, one of the reasons their program works so well, my guess is, is because they're really, really good therapists. Yeah. So as you're talking, I'm thinking, use your manuals and your models and techniques in the spirit of becoming a better clinician mm -hmm. and, uh, and vice versa, that there, there can be a very nice choreography uh, that takes place. But boy, you're absolutely right about newer clinicians sometimes really like the, uh, 
a sort of well training wheels isn't a very nice expression but the kind of guide uh you know the guide ropes yeah. i guess um yeah it's it's like i remember at the beginning like when i started working after college it's like you know i want to i want to have like good judgment here or like i want to be able to do things and it's like experience only comes with time and it's like you can't just like inject experience into somebody like I was doing supervision uh, earlier this morning and somebody goes, well, a client said that, you know, if they need to go uh, back to prison, they're going to like hang themselves. How do I react to that? And we have to go through the, through the whole like, okay, you have to assess whether are they're serious or not, what extent, are they coping? Do they have any future orientation? Uh, but uh, it's, um, it's really, that comes with experience and also the relationship that you have with the client and uh, the context. And uh, thankfully, this wasn't a, a situation that the client was actively suicidal, but uh, it's one of those things that just comes with time. And being a clinician, and this is one of the wonderful things about the profession is that we're always learning. Yes. There's always going to be somebody that comes in with a, with a, a curveball uh, we try to figure out and uh, it, that's what makes things exciting yeah you know we start with knowledge and we gain wisdom over time yeah exactly. absolutely absolutely oh. otherwise yeah. we would do something else <laughs> yeah 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 very true you know the one uh, point last point on risk needs and responsivity i should mention is that in the good lives model very often if you go and you look at uh, uh andrews and bonta's big eight of risk factors for example um you can see how they can be the flip side of the good life goals uh, depending on the nature of your client and the assessment yeah. that you do yeah yeah so how does how does a good assessment work in this uh in this model yeah, well, I um, usually the way that I tend to think about it is um, start with the right risk assessment, um, uh, choose your measures accordingly, um, steep your assessment in what we know from the research, um, the strengths and limitations of the various instruments that you use, get a handle on risk, then do a more comprehensive assessment to determine uh, what the treatment needs are and the responsivity needs are. I work in um, in sort of deeper dish environments where our clients come to us with lots of um, uh, past assessments that can that can guide us. Get a handle on risk and need and responsivity, and then try to figure out the narrative, not just what are the risk factors, but how have these risk factors been present um, in this person's life? I'm borrowing that from a uh, that expression from another colleague, uh, but also understand the narrative. Where did these risk factors come from? Very often, what I find is early life adversity and trauma seems to have resulted in the barriers to normal development for my clients. And that those barriers to normal development then morphed into risk factors, which then tend to be the flip side of the good life goals that we're now going to try to work towards. With some people, it can be as simple as building up their skills to get what they want out of life. With other people, there can be more of a persuasion uh, or more uh, exploration that sometimes their goals have come into conflict uh, with one another and that um, they're going to have to balance how they get some of their goals um, or to expand the scope of the goals that they have um, in their lives. So I, I start with risk, move into a comprehensive assessment along the way, also trying to figure out what are the um, areas of resilience and protective factors uh, that are going to help this person and then get to know the story. And for me, that's the that's the most important piece of it is try to explain the narrative of how this person went from child to um, to who he is or she is today, so that it's not as simple a process as what Tony Ward once referred to as the pincushion theory, that treatment is about where you just remove risk factors like so many pins um, out of a pincushion, but how do we actually come alongside this client and help them uh, move into a, into a different life? In that way, treatment with the good lives model is something that we should be uh, doing for them and with them not simply to them and on them. Yeah. Thank you. It's it's a um, it's a really nice way to go deeply into into the person's 
history narrative, really try to understand them. And I think um, for me, it, it intellectually is very gratifying to, to be able to try to put in the, the puzzle together. What led to that offense and all the pieces that made fit. Uh, and sometimes the puzzle has a few pieces and sometimes the puzzle is one of those uh, uh, really ones that give you a headache because the borders are, are not rectangular and uh, they have a different shapes in the pieces, but really it is really, really uh, is, uh, intellectually stimulating to try to figure out why. And I think that to a certain extent, a good, a good chunk of, of us who got into, into counseling is because we want to learn why people do or why people behave the way they do. Um, so, I mean, for, for newer clinicians who are listening to this, to, to get, into the, get into the records and read the records and, and try to develop hypotheses and test them out with, with the client and uh, in order to, in order to, for the clients to understand themselves too. Yeah. And never, ever, ever give up your curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you will find always good things about your client, even, even those who are very, very unlikable. There's always something there. There's always something that we will, we will find like, likable and we can like hang on to that as we deal with the rest of the stuff. May I add a case example? Would that be sure, okay? Of course. So it just as you were speaking, I, I was thinking of a client and we just happened to be doing this um, interview um, on the, the anniversary of when he came into treatment. I don't know why I remember this. It was eons ago, but I did my first interview with him and I thought he's not very likable. I mean, I want to like him, but I'm just not getting any traction with this particular kid and I was asking him about anything that he might be good at and uh and he said he was good at nothing nothing absolutely nothing blah 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 and and I I, I think I probably didn't handle it very well in retrospect but I said you got to be good at something um you know give me something to work with and he thought for a while and he said you know I once fixed my uh, my uncle's generator. Uh, it was broken. Somehow I managed to, to fix it. I, I took out the manual and I fixed it. I guess that's it. So, so I said, small engine repair works for me. That's something you could really do. This guy went on decades later and he managed uh, an auto parts store. Yeah. And I kept thinking, you know, I wonder to what extent he fell into that and to what extent that was a result of our conversation. At least in mm -hmm. that moment, we focused on strength. And if I hadn't really begged the question, I wouldn't have gotten that answer. But we put him to work in an auto mechanics class and all kinds of things yeah. like this. So that's how it works. And yeah, that's that's awesome. And it is uh, see that that that's the thing that. Uh, that doesn't make it into manuals, and that uh, it's it's hard to convey to uh, to to newer clinicians about what may be, you know, it's like the the grandmother making a sauce that tells you, you know, just add salt. How much salt? Enough salt. Well, <laughs> what does that mean? So it's 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 trying to find a hook, and sometimes it's the weirdest thing. Um, I once asked, asked a client who we weren't connecting very well either. Uh, very uh, uh, came from a very poor background. He had missing teeth. Uh, he was very uncomfortable with me. And finally, after asking him about substance use, I I asked him, "So how do you make a blunt?" And he looked at me. He's like, "You don't know how to make a blunt." I'm like, "No, I." I know that it comes from a cigar, but if you cut the cigar, it breaks apart. And he started cracking up, big, big laugh. And he explained to me how to make a blunt. And for the rest of the interview, he started, ch he would chuckle every once in a while and uh, refer back to me not knowing how to make a blunt. But it made everything more, more comfortable. And, and so getting, getting, he was very good at uh, a rolling blunt. Excellent. You're the expert on psychology, but only he was the expert on blunts. <laughs> nice. That's right. Nice. Talk about a partnership. 
<laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, all right. So what what do you think would be the is the therapist stance in, in the good lives model? What 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 should therapists aim for? Sure. And I, I should give credit where it's due. The idea of two and uh, treatment to, uh, excuse me, um, with and for a client versus two and on them is a classic motivational interviewing um, uh, uh, axiom. Uh, for, for how do we, how do we implement a good lives model? I go straight to uh, Bill Marshall's work uh, where he talked about word, uh, W-E-R-D, warm, empathic, rewarding, and directive. To that end, I'll even mention a study. It's little known by a guy named Tim Apodaca, and I'm not sure that his findings are the same as everybody's. But he looked at all of the um, skills used in motivational interviewing, and he asked the question, you know, if, if sometimes people ask the wrong question and it can make things worse, sometimes people say the wrong thing and it makes things worse. Is there anything that doesn't make people worse? And he found out that when you give people affirmations, yeah. Um, that that does not cause any harm. It's like one of the few risk-free things that we can do. It might puff up some people whose egos are already pretty puffed up, but I've always found um, pretty narcissistic clients really have fragile egos underneath. And yeah. that when you're offering an affirmation. So I think it's, it's those kinds of things. It's intended to be collaborative. It's intended to be strengths-based. Um, it's intended to, uh, to mesh nicely. Um, with really good cognitive behavioral therapy or motivational interviewing, something, by the way, called the self-regulation model, um, mm -hmm. and a solid understanding of protective factors. So, I would say that it, it goes well with er, er, anything. I mean, I I was trained psychodynamic, and it's like it's it's like it's it's talking my language. I mean, I just yeah, you know, we don't. The good life's model, thank God, doesn't include all the weird terms that psychodynamic uh, psychology uh, creates. I don't know why they did that, but um, um, you know, the, everything Freud too. But you know, he was on drugs anyway, um, so we know. There's a there's a lot of treatments out there that have been given names that don't sound like anything I want to be a part of. If you told me we're going to use, um, I don't know, uh, response set theoretical interventions, I'd be like, please, can't we do I, something I, else? I won't tell you about the British object relations that talk about erotic transference and erotic kind of transference. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. <laughs> and it's all in the term. It, it, it's okay, but you know, it's all in the terms. Yeah. Well, on, the, on that note, <laughs> We're coming to the end of our conversation, uh, but I wanted to thank you and to encourage all the listeners to uh, do some research, learn more about the Good Lives model, uh, go to conferences, look at webinars. Uh, it's very much worth your time. And uh, thank, thank you, you, David. Always a pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you for... Um, visiting with us at uh, ASA's back channel. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, don't forget to visit ATSA.com. Until next time, I'm Alejandro Leguizamo for the Education and Training Committee. <laughs>